Well, welcome back to another video tutorial, and this is a second in our short library of video tutes regarding chemical equilibria, in which we're going to talk about all of these different equilibrium constants that you come across in this topic. In this case, we're going to talk about KSP. It's the solubility product. Lots of ionic compounds are actually only sparingly soluble in an aqueous medium. And there's a long list of examples there. And you can see the kinds of metals we're talking about and the kinds of anions that we're talking about in these systems. Lead, obviously a big one there. Most lead, um, most lead in organic species, very insoluble in water. So let's have a look at the equilibrium that's in place here. So in a saturated solution, an equilibrium exists between any undissolved solid and its dissolved form. And you can see the equilibrium expression there. In this case, we've got lead chloride, and it's in equilibrium with lead ions and chloride ions. And you can see the stoichiometry there. And the stoichiometry, as we know, in equilibria is important. So one mole gives one mole of lead ions and two moles of chloride ions. So the solubility, and we'll define that term properly, the solubility of a solid is the largest amount which will dissolve in a given volume of solvent. And solubility is highly temperature dependent. So if the temperature changes, then the actual value of Ksp changes. So in general, for a slightly soluble ionic compound, we'll give it this general formula, uh, MAXB. You can see it dissociates in that form there. And so we can set up an equilibrium expression, what we call the KSP expression, to look like this. And notice that the coefficients in that balanced equation appear as the powers to each of those respective concentrations, and that's important. We talked about reaction quotient in the previous video tutorial. So in this case, we talk about QSP. And this is used to determine the extent of the reaction. We know that at equilibrium, Q equals K. Well, let's have a look at this example here. We've got uh, aluminium sulfate. And you can see that it's in uh, an equilibrium with those two ions, so aluminium 3 plus and sulfate 2 minus. And you can see how the coefficients in that balanced equation manifest in the reaction quotient expression. Let's have a look and see what would happen as we vary the concentration for each of these two species. If we actually think of the equilibrium constant as being a, a basically a constant value for Q, you can plot how the concentration of sulfate might change with respect to aluminium, or vice versa. And you would actually get this exponential looking plot here. If we look at the two regions, if you like, above and below this line, we have the region where Q is greater than Ksp, so chemically speaking, if we think about what would happen in a test tube or a beaker of this stuff, if Q is greater than Ksp, we would see some precipitation. What we're really saying is the number of moles of each of uh, the two species in this case here would give you, uh, sub subbed into that equation, would give you a value larger than the K. And therefore we would have to see some pre material precipitating out. If Q was less than K, we would see no precipitation, and all of the material in solution would dissolve. So in summary, if QSP is less than KSP, the solution is undersaturated. It's not at equilibrium yet, and more solute could still be dissolved. We know that if Q equals K, then the solute and the solution are in equilibrium. But if Q is greater than Ksp, the solution is supersaturated. It's not at equilibrium, and we should be seeing some precipitation. Remember that this is a dynamic situation, and the diagram at the bottom of this slide here shows that if you have a little lump of some sort of solid, there really is a dynamic scenario going on there with um, molecules, or ions I guess in this case, are dissociating and reassociating all of the time in a dynamic uh, 
uh, in a dynamic way. But the concentration of the two ions in solution would remain constant. Let's have a look at a few numerical problems. And we'll start with this one here. Calculate the solubility of lead chromate in water. And it gives the value in this question for the KSP. Well, let's set the question up. Let's make sure we know what we're dealing with. And the first thing we do is we write out the chemical reaction. This is the dissociation of the molecule in water. You can see our states are included there. We have solid on the left and aqueous for our two ions on the right-hand side. The KX, KSP expression looks like this. The stoichiometry of this reaction was 1 gives 1 to 1. So we have 1 mole of this stuff, 1 mole of this stuff, and 1 mole of this stuff. So you'll notice that the powers in this reaction is to the power of 1. In other words, we don't really write it. <clears throat> So KSP uh, equals that expression there. Well, let's have a look at what would happen if we threw a lump of this stuff into some water. Whoops. What have we got here? As you know, I like to tabulate data when tackling these kinds of problems. So initially, what's the state of affairs? Well, the concentration of the two ions is zero. For the lead chromate, we don't actually specify a concentration there. This is a lump of solid sitting at the bottom of a beaker or a test tube. So we don't need to express concentration for the solid. As the solid slowly dissolves, we eventually move towards equilibrium. Because the stoichiometry in this case is one to one, we should end up with the same concentration of lead ions as chromate ions. And at this stage, let's just call that X. If we substitute x into our KSP expression, like this, we can see that basically x squared equals 2.3 times 10 to the minus 13. Solve for x and you get that value there. In other words, the solubility of lead chromate in water is 4.8 times 10 to the minus 7 moles. Let's look at another question, very similar question in this case here, slightly different molecule. We're given the KSP value, we'll set up our chemical reaction, and the first thing you guys should notice is that the stoichiometry in this case, however, is different. One mole of the lead fluoride dissolves to give one mole of lead ions and two moles of fluoride ions. Let's set up our table and what you should notice is that when we move towards equilibrium, if we say that we have X moles of lead ions in solution, we would actually get two X moles of fluoride ions. So if we sub this into our KSP expression, suddenly it looks a little bit different. There's a couple of things to take into account here. The first is, don't forget that we have to square this term. That comes from the stoichiometry of the reaction. Notice here that we also have x multiplied by 2x squared, which ends up giving us a term of 4x cubed. Punch that into your calculator and you can solve for x. But be careful about what this means. This gives you the new iron concentrations and you'll notice that the iron concentration for fluoride is twice as much as it is for lead. Remember this value here. We're going to come back to this one when we solve the next problem. And here it is. What if I threw a lump of lead fluoride into a solution which already had fluoride ions in it? Okay, in this case, it's a 0 0.04 molar solution of potassium fluoride. Potassium fluoride is extremely soluble. You can assume that all of that, if I was to chuck a lump of potassium fluoride in water, is very good at dissociating. So if I have 0.04 moles, molar solution of KF, what I'm really saying is I have a 0.04 mole solution of fluoride ions. Now, our reaction is still the same, the stoichiometry is still the same, but here's our table 
of data. And notice in this case here, the first line, the initial concentrations, is different to the previous problem. In the previous problem, we saw that the initial concentration of fluoride was zero. In this case, it's already elevated. If we look at the change, we can see that, say if we, again, call the amount of lead ions in solution as X, the concentration of F minus is actually going to be the initial concentration plus 2X. Now, there's a little trick you can play at this stage. We, we know that lead fluoride is reasonably insoluble. It's sparingly soluble. So 2x is actually substantially smaller than 0 0.04. We saw in the previous question it's about 10 times smaller. So the good news is we can actually assume that the concentration of fluoride is pretty much unchanged. You can try and solve this problem without making this approximation and I encourage you guys to do that for your own satisfaction. It's actually going to make very small difference to the final answer. So the good news is we can make the approximation that F minus is unchanged. This focus is called the common iron effect. So if we sub the fluoride concentration of 0 0.04 into our KSP expression, we get uh, a value for X, uh, that is the lead iron concentration of 2.3 times 10 to the minus 5. Now compare this value to the previous question, where we saw the lead iron concentration more like 10 to the minus 3, in other words, 100 times larger. So the common iron effect basically means you can't dissolve as much of a sparingly soluble salt in solution if one of those ions is already present in the solution. That's the common iron effect. And if you like, it's really just a manifestation of the Le Chatelier principle, isn't it? I'll leave that to you guys to think about. And that brings us to the end of this video tutorial. Make sure you watch the other video tutorials in this chemical equilibria series.